In July, the Correctional Association of New York, an independent oversight entity of the state's prison systems, released a report on changes for the correctional system based on a monitoring visit to Sing Sing Correctional Facility in Westchester County earlier this year. To learn about the visit and subsequent policy recommendations, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Stephen Phelps, Vice Chair for the Correctional Association of New York. Welcome to the program, Reverend. Thank you, David. So for starters, you know, thinking about this, and I guess in a positive light, what appears to be working at Sing Sing that could be replicated around the prison system in New York? There's a really simple answer to that one, and it comes under the heading programs. Sing Sing is unusually effective compared with many, many and maybe even all of New York State prisons in having allowed private entities and to some extent uh, hosting in their own capacity various kinds of programming. The kinds of things that the prisons generally do that come under the heading programs include vocational training. And so there are in most of the Max's shops where you can learn to weld or do electrical work or plumbing and barbering and so on. And and the additions that Sing Sing brings to it are many of them are private. So for example, I, I should say NGOs, outside entities. There is a program for putting plays on primarily called Rehabilitation Through the Arts. It's active in a handful of prisons in addition to Sing Sing. They're all in the lower Hudson Valley. There is a program of the New York Theological Seminary in which I was an adjunct professor for three years, wherein an incarcerated person who has a bachelor's degree can get a master's training and a master's degree. Uh, I taught in that program. Mercy College brings BA level training. And so you can go from illiterate to a master or or having a master's in Sing Sing. This, uh, This spirit of hope shared by the administration in some important ways with any number of the incarcerated men can be replicated, but it takes intention. It takes intention in the legislature to fund it. It takes intention from the governor and other executive staff. We don't really see that very often. uh, And and to some extent, I think I'll, I'll finish my comment with this. The superintendents of the various prisons may feel uh, uh, completely powerless to shift because they need more money than they have. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's, uh, maybe that cuts them too much slack because I, I don't know that they care intensely to increase the programming. Uh, but programming is a crying need in all the prisons. Sing Sing does a good job at it and is high in our estimation in that regard. Well, then turning to an area for improvement, uh, communication, broadly speaking, uh, is a trend where you think there could be improvement at this Westchester County prison. Uh, can you talk broadly about the areas of communications that you want to see addressed uh, moving forward? What needs to be communicated to the incarcerated man and woman is, and I'm talking about all prisons, the policy whatever policies, be they new or in some cases standing policies, such that not only does the incarcerated individual know the policy or at least have access to it, but the staff, the security staff in particular, not only know the policy, but know that their supervisors are aware that certain things are going to be expected of them in the detailed day-to-day work where security officers are dealing with the incarcerated men and women. So our experience from our interviews with the incarcerated is that they frequently report two, two different breakdowns in communications. One is, no, we don't know. And two is, well, we know, 
but the CEOs do not actually follow the regulations that have been expressed. They make up the rules on their own. And so it's a commonplace to hear them say, uh, well, one man spoke specifically of a very simple issue of dignity, that he was permitted by one CEO to hang a curtain near the toilet during the times he was using it. And another CEO punished him for it in a way that I forget what the punishment was, whether it was a loss of privileges or going to the, the box for some days. This is un, utterly unacceptable. And obviously, a communication didn't go to the COs, com, correctional officers. I'll continue to use that phrase, CO, and that's what it means. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, they do not have a, a clear communication and they're not being held to account. Unless, of course, if one wants to go there, you assume that the incarcerated are always lying. And I, of course, don't I make that assumption. The accounts they give of their experiences are reasonable, and the, their presentation of them is both painful to hear, and they don't seem to be in a complaining mode. It's, it's simply that the, there's a lack of communication. The PA system, public address system, is as bad as, as say, the old uh, one line in Manhattan, where you know that, that they're giving you an announcement on the train that there's something unusual about the stops, but you can't hear anything because of the ambient noise and no effort has been made on that old, those old cars, which are now out of service to improve the quality of the communication. So if anybody has ever been frustrated by a trip on the one line in, in the old days in Manhattan, multiply that by a hundred when your life is on the line, almost literally, uh, because a communication is coming down and you cannot decipher it. It's, there's too much noise and the quality of the hardware is so low and the quality control is non-existent. The communication cannot be heard. Your prison owes it to the men to have a state-of-the-art communications systems. These could include PA, uh, a new PA system throughout the prison. It could include that the laptops, or they're called tablets because they're limited in their capabilities, that the tablets are used for regular communication so that a man can always consult a given page on the tablet to find out any new regulations or any standing regulations. And I realize the administration in their response to our report has said, we're doing everything perfectly. Uh, none, of your, none of your complaints are valid. Everything we're doing is right. That's frustrating but let's set it aside for a moment. The men talking to us say they don't know the regulations and they don't believe that the COs have access to or are being held to account to a well-communicated set of regulations and rules. Well, those are several areas in which communications could be improved. We well, mentioned this idea of improved uh, technology, and one of the areas where technology is important uh, in, in prisons is the way we capture what actually happens uh, in these facilities. And you've got some concerns about cameras, including fixed cameras, as well as uh, body cameras. Can you talk about uh, what you'd like to see done there and, and how representative are, are those concerns for the prison system as a whole? Great question. I was in a program of conversation, open-ended conversation with men inside Attica for 10 years back in the early part of this century. So I had a lot of information and a lot of stories and fascinating conversations. One thing the men in Attica back then asked for was fixed cameras all over the prison. And the resistance, as we came to understand it, now I did not have the official capacity that Kenny Correctional Association of New York has. I was in a program of volunteers, which is different from Kenny's legislative authority to monitor prisons. Let me just clarify. So I'm going back 20 years to tell a story that I 
take to be true and accurate, which is that the security staff were opposed to having cameras. And also Attica was known to be an extremely dangerous place for many, many incarcerated, that there were many physical assaults by corrections officers on men inside. These, these stories have been reported by Kenny in its review of Attica and some other more violent prisons. Fixed cameras make a difference. We have recent proof. I was also in attendance at the monitoring visit of, that Kenny made in Kaksaki prison just to 10 days ago or two weeks ago. And the superintendent there was telling us that there are over 1,700 fixed cameras, and we saw them as we toured the prison in all various areas. There's been an effort to cause there to be no blind spots. I'm, I'm not sure how successful anybody could be with a complex building. The correlation of reduced violence of incarcerated against COs and COs against incarcerated, or the reports thereof, have gone down dramatically, according to the Kuksaki uh, reports. So what can be generalized? First of all, Sing Sing does not have an adequate number of fixed cameras in, in order to send a message. It's a communications issue, as you already have shown. Uh, it's a different type of communication. The communication is what you do in this prison in not in your cell the, these these uh, cameras do not depict men in their cells that let's clarify that but in all the public spaces what you are doing is being watched or can be seen and therefore uh, in fact we learned from the superintendent and and others confirmed it at Kuksaki uh, the facility upstate the first thing that happens when a grievance is filed by an incarcerated man is a call for the film <laughs> which is great frankly uh, i don't i can't report on the consequences thereof but in principle we need to have uh, they need to have access whether a co defending his own actions her own actions or an incarcerated person defending is to be able to say, show me the film is key. So Sing Sing needs to get there and, and body cameras, as we know from the security, the dangers to the public presented by police and sometimes on police uh, outside in the, in the cities of our nation, body cams can make a difference. So. These are important changes, and they are a type of communication. Good connection. And after a quick break, we'll continue our discussion with Stephen Phelps, vice chair of the Correctional Association of New York State, which released a report this summer on improvements to the state's prison system based on a February 2022 visit to Sing Sing Correctional Facility. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. UnionStrongNY.com for more information. For listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're continuing a conversation with Reverend Stephen Phelps, vice chair of the Correctional Association of New York, which released a report in July on potential improvements to the state's prison system based on a visit by the organization to Sing Sing Correctional Facility earlier this year. Another recommendation has to do with addressing staffing shortages. What personnel issues did you notice uh, or did representatives from the Correctional Association notice uh, during their time at Sing Sing? And what problems are created by inadequate staff? A key area is that programs, for example, the vocational training I was just speaking of. Well, when we were at Sing Sing, these were largely still shut down on account of COVID, or so they were told back 
briefly on a communications issue, the men from the in incarcerated liaison committee, ILC, were saying, we are never told what the duration of the COVID regulations is going to be. There's not any information. So programs are shut down. The, their, part of the reason for that was lack of staff. They couldn't find people to hire, and it's possible also that being in Westchester County, where the cost of living is uh, several notches higher than in many parts of the state, that it's very difficult to attract a person. This would be true for security as well as programming and other administrative support. It's just hard to get people to say, oh, I, I'll take a new job. Uh, I'll leave Auburn in the Syracuse area and go down to, we'll, we'll make a move because that's a, a, that would be a good increase. Well, maybe not if the housing costs and so on are too high. Lack of staffing, I believe most of what we encountered in our monitoring visit did have to do with COVID and the so-called great resignation because the, the executive team from the superintendent down were saying, we just can't find the people to hire. Sometimes there's a connected concern, which is we don't have the money. There's been a hiring freeze. That was also a feature that I understand uh, Governor Hochul lifted uh, shortly after she was installed as governor. Men languishing in their cells with no ways to use their innate intelligence are really in danger to themselves and potentially even to others in the long run. It's bad for mental health, of course, to be idle for extended periods of time. And it, it undermines a sense of meaning, a sense of hope for life. Uh, to the degree that now I'm swinging wide on a, on a separate issue, which is that the electorates in America generally are, don't care at all about men inside. But this is a very low level of, of, of thought on the part of the electorate to not care. Because these men will come home. Um, I think it's something like 98% of people have a conditional release date. They will come home. Will they come home more or less dangerous? The way we do prison in America, they come home more hurt and the damage to society is intensified. So programming is a really big deal. And getting the pay up so that good managers of either vocational programming or uh, academic, because there's GED training, and, the, and of course I've mentioned these other private entities, but those that are sponsored by the state, which have mostly to do with, with skills training and, and manual tasks of one kind or another, these should be kept at optimal levels. And furthermore, uh, there ought to be much attention to training that the one who, a man who's completed say a welding course over eight weeks or however long it takes can move on to an electrical can move on to a barbering, uh, that there's no limitation. Typically, we hear that they are limited. No, no, you've already had one course. There won't be any more for the next five years or some number like that. This is, this is so backwards. Uh, men need to use their minds. Women, men and women who are in prison need to use their minds and should be encouraged to it. They themselves say, this is part of my rehabilitation. Uh, but we don't hear much about that from, from staff. Should there be conditions on accessing these types of programs or, or stricter conditions, like, like thinking about this idea of uh, a good behavior uh, or even exceptional behavior to access these types of programs? Or because, like you're saying, these programs are so beneficial to incarcerated New Yorkers once they are released from prison, that there should be uh, ex exceptions and that uh, there should be a uh, focus on how to get these people into these programs, regardless of you know what they might be doing in their other time behind bars. Yeah. Yeah. I think you've put your finger on an important idea. 
Security officers do need to have carrots and sticks. There's no question. And, and anybody who tries to think about this in a different mind is probably making a serious error about human psychology. So yes, uh, I, I wouldn't go for a more complex labeling than, than a binary, good behavior, bad behavior. If a person has a demerit on their behavior that causes them not be able to gain access to something they desire, that can be beneficial. Of course it can. It works for all of us. That if, if there's a consequence, a negative consequence for something we did that was harmful to ourselves or others, then it, at least if there's an opening for how do I repair my demerit, if you want to use a simple uh, innocuous term, how do I repair the demerit? Does it take three months? Does it take six to prove good behavior? If all that were clarified, yes, I would certainly support, or I think I could speak for Kenny, we in Kenny support the idea that the security officers need carrots as well as sticks, that is consequences that are undesirable for certain kinds of behavior. But I wouldn't ever think that there should be a gradation like, well, if you get to the level one, you're at level three right now, or maybe we could put you back in a program. And that's a little arbitrary and subjective and so on. Well, sticking then with this idea of behavior by the incarcerated New Yorkers themselves, what sort of attention on these visits do you pay to the actual conduct of the people who are behind bars? And are there ever recommendations on how their behavior could be improved? I guess putting the onus on the incarcerated New Yorkers to some degree, as opposed to making the recommendations all about the establishment there, the, the, the prison guards, the people running the facility. Is that something that, that comes up at all? And if not, why not? That's a sophisticated question. Um, oh, this is public media, Stephen. So, you know, we really try to bring it. <laughs> <laughs> you do well. You do very well. The numbers of ways in which men, people, incarcerated New Yorkers are restricted in their, for their behavior, their bad behavior, their unacceptable behavior are so numerous and constant that I, I really don't think that Kenny needs to make recommendations on how the punishments inside beyond which get far exceed the pain of actually losing your liberty for X number of years. It, it is true of New York prisons as elsewhere that in this country, the pain of how one is treated inside is a significant and non-legislated pain that goes way beyond the question of restricting liberty for a person deemed by a jury or a judge to be dangerous to society. So I don't think there's a necessity there to come up with new recommendations for how to sanction bad behavior. Uh, it, it is sanctioned severely by the COs, and I'm not suggesting that all those sanctions are wrongful, not at all. Uh, we're looking to, we, Canny, are looking to make sure that, that the types of sanctions employed do not become well, what the Constitution calls cruel and unusual. That, that's the issue. Your listeners may be will be interested to have a brief acquaintance with a new law called HALT, which had not yet gone into effect at the time of our Sing Sing visit. HALT is a, an acronym that starts out to humane alternatives to long-term, and then the rest of it isn't in the acronym, long-term uh, confinement or solitary confinement. And the limitation basically is that the, the box, which the, the outside world would often think of as solitary confinement, 
the, the vox shall not be used as a sanction for more than 15 days at a time. And this is being implemented. I, I'm not really, from my experience in listening to the men in the Koksaki prison, I don't think we have enough data to know whether it's being implemented well, it's a, it's a rather new law. But it wasn't implemented at the time of the visit at Sing Sing. And so, in fact, men were reporting, and I've encountered this throughout my 20 or 25 years of close contact with men inside, that the solitary confinement sometimes has extended for one year, even two, even longer years, and the mental deterioration that comes as a result is intense and is even indeed cruel and unusual punishment. Our, our report is addressed to the public through whatever media pick it up. And of course, it's written for docs in particular with recommendations to docs. I don't know that docs needs any further help in, I'm not saying they, they shouldn't use uh, methods, carrots and sticks, uh, but they, they, they know what the sticks are and they, they use them. They use them. Well, we've been speaking with Stephen Phelps. He's the vice chair for the Correctional Association of New York, which recently released a report on improvements that can be made to the New York state prison system based on a visit earlier this year to Sing Sing Correctional Facility. Stephen, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. Thank you. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals in education, human services, and healthcare. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.